Good evening. You can settle in and get ready for tonight's service. A reminder, if you have a cell phone, if you could turn it off or put it on silence so it doesn't disturb tonight's preaching. If we could bow for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you once again, Lord, that we can gather in your name. We thank you, Lord, for saving us. And we thank you, Lord, that it's only by the blood of Jesus that we're saved, Father. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for providing your word for us. We thank you for all you've done for us, Father, and making a plan for us here on earth, Father, that we could have a purpose and a meaning to the life we live as Christians, Lord. And I pray, Father, and lift up the Manguel family to you, Lord, and Adelina, Father, and I lift them up, Father, that you would just comfort their hearts. Strengthen them, Lord. Just give them the grace that they need to endure through this time, Father. And I also lift up all those that are going through different adversities, Father, whether it's spiritual or physical. You know them by name, Father. I lift them up before you, and I pray that you would help them to lift the shield of faith, Father, and to trust you through whatever they're facing, Lord. And I pray, Father, for the message tonight. I pray for Pastor John as he brings it forth. I pray once again you would just speak through him, Lord, by the power of your Spirit. We thank you for him and his faithfulness to us, Lord, and to teach us, and to guide us, and help us to be equipped, Lord, to live this life. I pray, Father, that all that we do will bring glory and honor to your Son, Jesus, tonight. In his name we pray. Amen. If we could stand and worship the Lord.
seated. Just one announcement. Tomorrow night is Pastor's Prayer and Praise Night at 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. All are welcome to attend. And there will be no service this coming Friday. With that said, kids and teachers could be dismissed to class. Now it's my honor and privilege to introduce our pastor, Pastor John Ritchie. Okay, How, how's everybody doing tonight? Doing okay? Um, while we're getting settled, and I have a couple of things to announce. Um, first, why don't we turn to uh, 2 Timothy, if you will, chapter 2, and then uh, I just want to uh, notify, you may already know, um, our brother Richard Mangual, he passed away this uh, past Sunday in the afternoon at Miriam Hospital. Um, Richard was a wonderful brother, humble, sweet guy, and uh, we're going to miss him dearly. Uh, thankfully, Mike and I were able to be there with the family and with Richard as he as he passed, and we were able also to share the gospel with everyone there, and that was, that was great, and that, that was one of Richard's requests that, we, that I would share the gospel to the family, and we'll do that again at the funeral. Uh, the wake will be on Friday evening, if you want to make a note of this. The wake will be Friday evening from 5 to 8 p.m., and it'll be held at Mariani, Mariani Funeral Home, and that's at 200 Hawkins Street in Providence. So the wake will be this Friday coming up between 5 and 8 p.m. Mariani Funeral Home, 200 Hawkins Street in Providence. The funeral will be on Saturday morning at 10 a.m., at the funeral home. So that's 10 a.m. Saturday morning at the funeral home. And the burial will be at the Gate of Heaven Cemetery. And that's in Riverside, 550 Wampanoag Trail. Again, the, the funeral, 10, 10 a.m. Saturday morning. Burial, that'll be at the funeral home. And the burial is at the Gate of Heaven Cemetery, 550 Wampanoag Trail in Riverside, Rhode Island. So if you can uh, be with us, please do come on out and help and you know, support the family at this time. I'm laughing because I'm looking at the, uh, not laughing, I'm smirking because it looks like bird dew and, and on top of the pulpit. And from time to time, we've had birds find their way into the chapel. In fact, uh, one day there was a bird tapping on the uh, metal of the windows and uh, sitting in the office downstairs thought somebody was trying to break in. <laughs> the next morning Mike came in and there was a bird up flying around here. It was a Sunday morning. We, we opened all the doors and he or she flew out. But, so that solved the mystery of who was banging on the door. There was nobody banging on the door. The bird was tapping on the, on the metal of the window. <laughs> so maybe another one got in. Uh, good Lord. All right, let's, let's go to prayer. Let's bow our heads and we'll go to prayer. Father, this evening we're so grateful and so thankful to have this time to be able to gather together as the people of God around the word of God and to the name of our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, tonight I pray that as we go to your word, you would indeed challenge our hearts and help us understand more truth, Lord, that we might be able to grow and live in a spirit of discernment in this day and age where evil seems to be growing faster and faster and taking over more and more of this world that we live in. Pray tonight if there be anyone that is listening to this message that is not saved, that your spirit would convict them 
of their need of Christ, that they might believe upon him and be saved. And I ask that you help me to speak with wisdom and grace, conviction and passion, with the authority your word deserves, and that I might take the knowledge you've given me and make this subject clear and accurate and understandable that your people may be blessed. And we ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay, so we want to continue. We, we had a, a little bit of a break from our study of the conflict of the ages. I was away for uh, one week, and then we had a snowstorm last week, which we wasn't much of a snowstorm, but we did precautionarily uh, cancel class on Wednesday. So we're going to pick up where we left off. We're looking at the conflict of the ages. Satan's offensive strategy. The kingdom of darkness attempts to distract believers from learning Bible doctrine. And of course, the scripture says in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, my people suffer for lack of knowledge. God's people suffer many, many things because of a lack of knowledge of his word, of who he is, his character, his promises, his plan, his provisions. And their faith does not grow because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Your faith is going to grow in direct proportion to the knowledge of the word of God that you build in the soul structure right here in your mind. Here's where your soul is, right here. So. Let's look at our first point from uh, Dr. Lewis Spurry Schaefer, who was a theologian and the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary and a tremendous writer on the spiritual life and the grace of God. Dr. Lewis Spurry Schaefer well stated, many are easily led to fix their attention upon secondary things unto the neglect holy the one primary thing, Bible doctrine. And Satan has blinded their eyes towards that which is of true eternal value. What Dr. Schaefer was saying is this, that m the majority of Christians, especially in the day and age we live in, because we are told in the last days many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They'll want to have their itching ears scratched. They'll have a form of godliness, but they'll deny the power thereof. And Dr. Schaefer it was basically saying there will come a time, and it was happening in his day, and he passed away in the early 50s, uh, where there will be a neglect of the teaching of the Word of God. Line upon line, verse upon verse, here a little, there a little where people, that won't be enough to satisfy people. They will, they will want more, and they will fix their attention on secondary things, things that may not be bad in themselves, you know. Uh, worship music is wonderful, but that's not what church is all about. Uh, you know, having groups where different people can meet, the, the youth and the, the singles and, you know, whatever. The men and the women, that's, that's nothing wrong with that, but that's not what it's all about. Activities, entertainment, that's not what it's all about. A church is not doing God's will unless the pastor is laboring in doctrine and teaching the Word of God. If Bible doctrine is not the primary emphasis, then it's not following God's plan. And uh, you can't look at, you know, we, we can look today in the day of megachurches, I mean, people have said, well, wait a minute, this, you know, that guy's got 10,000. Joel Osteen's got 20,000. Well, he's preaching fluff. You know, you get all the prosperity and faith healers. He's got thousands and thousands of people following him. But they're not teaching sound doctrine. You can get a crowd without doing God's will because Satan says, this whole world is mine, and I can give it to who I want. And if Satan can get preachers to teach the wrong thing, He'll what? Reward them. He'll bless them. He'll give them money and fame and popularity and big crowds. So Satan has blinded many Christians' eyes to the one thing that is of eternal value. You know, you, I hope you're holding a book in your hand right now. It's, it's called a Bible. It's an amazing book. This is God's Word. 
the God who created the whole universe gave us this book and he preserved it down through the centuries against all the attacks upon it and in this book God speaks the, the words in this book are God's very words, the words that he wants us to have. And it's these words in this book that reveal to us who God is and what his mind is and what he thinks about various subjects, what he commands, what he promises, what he provides. His whole plan for human history and planet Earth is in what's coming in the future in his kingdom. It's all contained in these pages. And it's unfolding from the time he created Adam and Eve until the time that the Lord Jesus comes and establishes his kingdom. It's all here. And he gave it to us. And God help us if we get to the point where we don't revere this above everything else. God help us if we get to the point where we forget that our God has spoken. And he has put it all down in the book for us to what? understand him and to know him like we talked about on our last time before I before the last couple of weeks before we uh, had to cancel the last couple of classes okay so now you think about it God has spoken in his word and yet today many churches and many Christians are going in for the secondary things and neglecting the thing that is of eternal value the primary thing this book. If, if God gave us this book, don't you think we ought to put every effort that we possibly can into really digging into it and understanding it and knowing it? And God gave you the Holy Spirit so you could understand it. And then you know what else he gives you? He gives you an actual Bible you can hold in your hand. So now you get a Bible, you get the Holy Spirit. He gives you a local church where you can go sit like a classroom and learn. And then he gives you something even more special. And more important, he gives you a prepared pastor teacher if you want it. If you really want a prepared pastor, you may be sitting in a church with some quack. But if you want it, God will eventually get you to a place where there is a prepared pastor. Okay? And he gives you a prepared pastor whose job is to labor in it and then teach it to you. So that you can know the God of the universe so that you can have an intimate relationship. So first of all, you can know that you have salvation, that your sins are forgiven, and know everything that his love has provided, and have the assurance that because Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for me, and I believe in him, I'm going to be in his eternal kingdom. I am saved and forgiven, and my, and, and my life is in the hands of Almighty God, and he's with me. What a precious truth that is. This book tells us that, right? And then the pastor's job is to labor to give you all the other information that God wants you to have. That's my job. My job is to beat my brains out studying and to labor to give you the information that God wants you to have that is necessary and vital to your spiritual growth. And it all depends on how far do you want to go. God will take you as far as your human volition is willing to go. God will take you as far as your desire is to go. Do you really want to go a long way in the Lord and, and, and learn all you can about him and receive everything that he has for you? God will do that for you. He doesn't expect you to be a genius. You don't have to have the best IQ to understand this book. The only thing you need to understand this book is the willingness to show up and study in a heart that says, God, I want you. Willing to seek him. That's all. He will do the what? Rest. That's the amazing thing. He will do the rest. Okay, but why today we have gotten to the point where so many are focusing their attention on the secondary things, as Dr. Schaefer said. This was prophetic, really. He never claimed to be a prophet. He just saw what was going on in the churches. And he said, unto the neglect wholly of the one primary thing, Bible doctrine. And why is that so? Because Satan has blinded the minds of Christians to the one thing that is more important than everything else, and that is the understanding of the Word of God. Let him that glorieth glorieth in this, that he knoweth and understandeth me. 
Jeremiah chapter 9, 20 to 23 says, to whoever glories, whoever boasts, who's ever proud of something, let him be proud of this. Let him glory in this. Let him boast about this. They know and they understand who? Me. God says that. That's the best thing you can boast about. Okay. Put our next point up on the board, if you will. Robert theme, RB theme. Also a, a really excellent Bible teacher. Um, controversial. I may not agree with everything he taught, but he had a tremendous portion of truth. And he said, he well stated, biblical truth is the sole complete revelation of God's perfect plan for the believer. Those who neglect his word have simply rented a room to the devil. When people go in for the secondary things and not the primary things, when people are looking for a feeling and an experience, some type of entertainment, some activities, superficial topics like how to have a better family, which is not a bad thing. The Bible will tell you that, but that's not the, the most important thing, okay? And when they go in for that, what are they really doing? They're renting space to what? The devil. They're renting space to the devil up here because their mind is not being renewed with the information that God wants them to have. And I'm going to go through, through it with you. I'm going to show you the information. I'm not going to teach on it all. Couldn't do that in a couple of classes. That takes years. But I'm going to tell you what you should be learning from a pastor teacher. Okay, because this is the information God wants you to have. And if you don't have it renewing your mind, you're renting space to the devil because you're going to get all other kinds of false concepts that are going to come in and take what? Foothold. That's what the Bible calls strongholds. They're going to what? Take, take up the space, you know? But it's the wrong information. Listen, there's always going to be information coming into this brain. Every day there's information coming into this brain. The key is to be focused on God's Word so that that information that's coming in is the truth of God's Word, which is leading you into a deeper knowledge and understanding of Him, increasing your faith, which will multiply your what? Peace and your prosperity in this life. It'll give you joy and comfort and purpose and meaning and prosperity. Okay. Put our next point up on the board. Satan and the kingdom of darkness works to get believers involved in churches that promote legalism, bunch of do's and don'ts, that's the Christian life, not grace. Emotionalism, seek after some experience or some feeling. Entertainment, let it be thrilling and have a good time. False signs and wonders, you know, all these fake healers that go around saying they're doing supernatural things. Crusading to clean up the devil's world. There's so many churches that get involved in politics and, you know, trying to you know, legislate morality. That's not what the church's goal is. The church's goal is to preach the gospel, get people saved, and then teach those who are already saved to become disciples. And then uh, activities to socialize the prosperity gospel and the host of many other false doctrines. Okay, that's Satan's goal. Do you see that? He wants to get churches focused on the secondary things and distracted from the what? The primary things. Now, here's the problem. Spiritual discernment among Christians is at an all-time low, folks. Most Christians cannot discern certain things that they should be discerning. And you cannot have spiritual discernment without the spiritual growth that comes from a deep knowledge of the scriptures. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and look at verse number 15. Now Paul is writing, he's writing to Timothy, and Timothy's a young preacher, okay? And of course, primarily this verse is to the preacher, Timothy, but it 
it also applies to every believer. And in verse 15 it says, Study, study, to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we're told that if we want to be an approved servant, if, you're, if you want to be a Christian, that, now what's it mean to be approved? It means someone who God says, you've groaned enough, you've passed some tests, I can now trust you. you can, I can use you. Okay? To be an approved servant. Now, can God use any believer at any time? Sure, he can use believers who are backslidden. But how much can he use them? Very little. But I know believers who've backslidden, who've given the gospel to people and they've gotten saved. So thankfully, God can, God can use you at any place. But is that what you want? You will, listen, the level of your spiritual growth, your spiritual condition will determine the effectiveness of your usefulness, how effective, how useful you will be to God. It all depends on your spiritual condition. So what is, what is it saying here? It's saying that you have to be approved, but to be approved, what are you going to do? What do you need to do to be approved? It says you need to what? Study. Hmm. There it is. A pastor, first of all, the pastor's job is to study, right? Study, 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 all day long, all, anytime he can have free time, study, study. That's what my life is, okay? It's constantly study and reading and praying and study and reading when I have what? Those times. Of course, I, have, I still work part-time. I have a family. You know what I'm saying? There's other things in life. But the majority of free time I have is devoted to studying the book, okay, so that I can be approved, but what about every believer? What, is, what does God require of you? He requires of you, if you want to be approved, someone that he can say, you know what, I'm going to be able to use you greatly. I'm going to be able to use you greatly. I'm going to be able to bless you greatly. You've got capacity. You're approved. Then you have to study. That's as simple as it is. And study what? You have to study this book. You say, Pastor, it's a big book. Where do I start? I'm a young believer. I've been a believer, but I've been in the you know, churches that didn't emphasize doctrine and teaching. What do I do? You got a pastor. You got a prepared pastor who is gifted and prepared by God, who does a lot of work, does a lot of the work for you. Listen, uh, do you know how to make Chateaubriand? Hmm? Okay. But there are chefs out there who can make it what? Excellently. Right? So if you wanted uh, Chateaubriand and you wanted to learn about it and you wanted to make it, you would go and what? Watch that chef and you would what? Study what that chef what? Does, right? Okay. And then you could sit down and you can enjoy the meal too, right? Because he'd cook it up for you. Well, that's the pastor's job. My job is to study and to take all the ingredients all the what? Information in the Bible and make a meal, a spiritual meal. And then what? Give it to you to what? Eat. And hopefully you have the right, hopefully your heart is in the right condition that you can swallow it and then what? Digest it. You know, not everybody's able to swallow it. Not everybody's able to digest it. And so then that word, that meal that the pastor prepared actually becomes what? Part of your what? Your thinking. And this is what's going to change your life. Let me tell you something. You can waste your whole life chasing after people, entertainment, work, business, psychologists, psychiatrists, motivational speakers, every success seminar that comes along the way, alcohol, drugs, that's the bad way to go. But your life is never going to change until you decide to be serious about studying God's Word. And you say, how do I start? You start with your prepared pastor. 
you start with your prepared pastor. You show up. When you can't show up, you get the information. And you concentrate and focus and learn. Look what it says. Study. So you don't need to be what? Ashamed. Because if you won't study his word, and you're a Christian, you will be ashamed. In what sense will you be ashamed? You will be ashamed because you will not receive from God everything that he wants to give you in this life and in eternity. You see, you will have been squandering and wasting. You know, if a, if a person, if, if, if a father had put some things aside for their son or their daughter and was going to, and it was a lot of tremendous things and wealth and prosperity and possessions and property, but he put a condition on it that that child has to, you know, grow up and mature to a certain level before they can get it. And that child spends their whole life till they're in their 70s and then die and go, go on and never really shows maturity and discipline and wisdom. And the father never gives the inheritance to them. That child's whole life was what? Shameful. It was shameful. Because they never achieved the condition that they needed to achieve to receive the highest and best that the father wanted to give them. God's put a lot of things aside for us, folks. A lot that he wants to do in us a lot that he wants to do for us, a lot that he wants to do through us. But it cannot happen if we do not take the command to study, to show ourselves approved seriously. If we don't take it seriously, then we'll just kind of wander through the Christian life until it's time to pass on from this life. Okay? All right, so we need to study. So the apostasy has, has begun in the churches, but, you know, let's, let's look at it this way here. God is putting something forth for us. He's, he's offering something to us, and he's promising us, you know what? I will withhold no good thing from them that walk uprightly. And he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think. This is God talking. And yet, today, the sad truth of the matter is this. Many Christians are rejecting God's plan, the primary thing, the learning of the Word of God from the pastor teacher, studying, actually opening the Bible and studying it. Coming, the local church is a classroom that God has given to you to take time out of your day. You know, some folks uh, work... <laughs> And, uh, and they go to school at the same time, you know? So they work during the day, and they go two, three nights a week, and they take what? Classes at the college. Maybe they go to the community college. Maybe they go to a, a university that has night classes, you know? You go down Providence to University of Rhode Island, take some night classes. Rhode Island College does the same thing, right? Or you could go to CCRI, wherever it may be. You work your regular 40-hour job, and then you go what? Two or three hours on for two or three times a week, and you what? You take some classes, right? And you study. Well, you go to a classroom. You learn from a professor, an expert, in whatever field it is that you've chosen to what? Learn, right? And you get your degree. Why do you do that? To better your life, right? To better your life. Uh, you make sacrifices. You discipline yourself. Put time aside to read and study, right? You go sitting in the lectures. You take notes. You focus. You listen, right? Why do you do it? Why do people do it? They want to better their life, right? When you get that degree, that degree opens doors, right? Makes life better. Gives more opportunities. Well, here we are. God says, I gave you a professor. It's called a pastor teacher, prepared pastor teacher. Not any pastor, a prepared pastor who actually rightly divides the word according to the grace of God and teaches it. And I give you a local church. That's your classroom. Yeah, you got to work during the day. But you know what? You can go to class at night. And you can improve your life. 
Let me tell you something. You improve your spiritual life, you improve everything. Okay? When you neglect your spiritual life as a Christian, you're, not gonna, you're gonna find yourself in some problems. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added, what? Unto you. You gotta get your priorities straight as a Christian. We're called to seek God first and his righteousness, and what will he do? He'll add everything else that we desire and need to our lives, okay? This is God's promise. So we have the local church, classroom. We have a pastor teacher who lectures. And, and today, you know what people have said? Ugh, I need more than that. Really, you need more than the Word of God. <laughs> God has given us a book. He's given us a prepared pastor. He's put the Holy Spirit in you, and he gives you a classroom, the church. And his people are saying, but I need more. What they want, what they're really saying is, my flesh doesn't like that. I need some excitement. I need some social life. I need some entertainment. I need to see something. I want to feel something. I want some excitement. And so what have the churches done? They have what? Catered to the flesh of unbelievers and carnal believers. And you know when it's going to show up the biggest? It's going to show up when uh, a real persecution comes and some real suffering happens in America. We're heading there, believe me. You see what's going on in this country right now? I mean, when, when, when they can pass abortion laws and, and government leaders get up and, and clap for, like, you know, partial birth abortion, and they clap and cheer for, for you know, they call it pro-choice, God calls it murder. Let me tell you something. You, you're, you're, you're killing a baby in, in that stage of development, Many of them born alive, and then a lot. They're, 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 we're heading, we're, we're, listen, I don't know if you see what's going on in this world. There's a great anti-Christian sentiment. And there's a wave, and it's gaining momentum. It's going to hit one day. Seems like right now it may be stayed off for a little bit, but it's going to hit. And, and where you have been spiritually and what you've been feeding this what? Soul is going to be really told out in that day. Will you be able to handle it? Will you be able to stand? The Bible says, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand in the evil day, lifting the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, praying unto what? All things. You see, when you study the Word of God, you're putting on armor for the battle. Anything else, the secondary things, is just playing church and of course not only will it show up in a time of persecution and suffering and it will in crisis in the country it will also show up when you pass away at the bema seat of christ when he looks at your life to determine what your life's reward would be and many find out that there is no reward because they wasted their time with the secondary things as Dr. Schaefer said, and they didn't focus on the primary thing, Bible doctrine. Okay. I want to put a verse up. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. And I know a lot of this is review of some stuff I've already said, but, you know, it's been two weeks since I taught on this subject, so I'm kind of just warming myself back up to it, so... You'll have to bear with me, pardon me for that. I have to kind of warm myself back up into it, okay? It's like if I didn't lift weights for two weeks, I'd have to go back and lift those weights that I always lifted very easily and regularly, okay? Now, and also bring all this back to our what? Our tension, our recall, our our ability to recall in our mind, okay? So some of this is being reiterated. We've already talked about it, but it doesn't hurt to talk about it again. And you know what? 
sometimes it's people online right now listening or maybe here tonight that this is the first time they're hearing this thing. So that's okay, we're here for them. Now, Jeremiah 6.16. Wow. Wow. Powerful verse. The nation of Israel was suffering. They were about to be conquered by their enemies. In fact, a brutal enemy, the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar. Jerusalem was going to be sieged and ransacked. They were going to end up dying of starvation and thirst. Uh, it, was, it was a terrible thing was going to happen because they had turned to idols and they had rejected the word of God. And uh, this is what God says through Jeremiah to them. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. Wow. God said, Go back to the old ways. Forget these newfangled ways of worship. Forget the rituals and the excitement that you find in the idolatry and go back to what I gave you, my word, my plan. Because if you do that, it, 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 it may not seem so titillating and sensational and exciting, but it's what's going to be good for you. And what's going to happen? You're going to find rest for your souls. You'll be in the safe place, in the good way, the Word of God. And the people said, we will not walk therein. My brothers and sisters, do not be a Christian who says to God, we will not walk therein. Be a Christian who says, I'm going to make every effort to study the Word of God so that I can be approved and experience everything that God wants to give me in my life and everything that God wants to do for me, through me, as part of his plan. Okay, let's go to our next point, if you will. If you could put it up on the board, Mike. Satan uses apostate leadership in the pulpit of local churches to distract believers from Bible doctrine. I, uh, I like to spend my uh, late nights. I study during the day. I, sometimes I have to work in the evening, have a part-time job, meet with people, spend time with the family late into the evening when every then it's quiet and everybody's in bed and you know the dogs are snoring on the end of the couch and I go out and put the TV on and I just like to check out what's going on in Christian television and I just put it on and, and I watch okay and I watch and I want to tell you something there are some men out there and women God help us, but women don't have the gift of pastor, okay? There's some women that are very smart, and uh, they can help with certain things. And I watch, and there are some men out there who are really great communicators. Great communicators. You know, and, and they got beautiful churches, big buildings, huge crowds. You know, fantastic uh, music and soloists and choirs and they preach and, they, and, and they're engaging they're engaging the problem is when you listen to them they say nothing wonderfully and they communicate about a lot of things and subjects and topics that just are not important to spiritual warfare spiritual growth and the Christian life and the battle and the purpose of God and even Many of them don't even give you a clear message of salvation. How do I know that I'm saved and forgiven and going to heaven? But I want to say this, because it happens to me. 
they're interesting to listen to. You sit there and you go, wow, this guy's a good speaker. Well, he's got some... They're good communicators. The problem is Christians don't have enough understanding of the Bible to discern that what these guys are communicating is poison. But it sounds really good and it looks even better. They're well dressed, they're slick, the churches are beautiful, the people are dressed up. There's fantastic entertainment and music going on, but the message is false. I, I, I find myself, sometimes I get, my discernment is really good, and I'm right away, yeah. Other times I'm really tired. I say, oh, let me just listen to what he's going to say. And they can draw you what? And then, of course, you know what happens. The soul structure takes over and, oh, red flag, red flag, red flag, red flag. You see? But here's the thing. This is what I'm trying to get across to you. Spiritual discernment is what we need in the day and age we live. And the only way we can have that is if we study the Bible with a prepared pastor and make it a priority of our life. Okay? Satan uses apostate leadership in the pulpit of local churches to distract believers from Bible doctrine. The goal of these pastors is to get a crowd. They use social activities, entertainment, emotional music and services, gimmicks and games, sensational prophecy teaching instead of sound doctrine teaching. You know, I've never, I never, it's amazing that this last 30, 40 years is, there's so many of these prophecy mongers, I call them. They're always trying to take the Headlines that are going on in today's newspaper, although who reads the newspaper anymore? That's on CNN or MSNBC or Fox or maybe on the internet feed that you get with the news, right? Whatever the headlines are going on in the world, and they try to take these headlines to convince you that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled, fulfilled and Jesus is coming tomorrow. Or if not tomorrow, maybe next week or the week thereafter. You know, and uh, they, they take what's going on in the world and they try to read it into what? What the Bible says about the coming of the Lord and the end times, and they make it sensational. And then, they, then usually they got, a, they got a pitch. After they do that, they, the pitch is buy my book and you can get all you need to know about it. You know, send me twenty nine ninety five and... You can learn more or get these tapes for $39.95. You've got a whole series or these DVDs, you know, whatever it is, whatever way they present it now, okay? But the, the point is, even when they attempt to actually teach something from the Bible, they twist the Scriptures. And they take the Scriptures out of context and they try to read what's going on in the world into the Scriptures. That's called eisegesis, reading into the passage something rather than exegesis, which is reading out of the passage what it actually what means. Okay, folks, it's a dangerous time that we live in. Put our next point up on the board, Mike, if you will. No, that's it, okay. Thought I had one more, but that's all right. I forgot to put it in. Let's do this. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. I want you to go there with me. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Okay, look what it says here. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit indwells every believer. And when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells you. He also gives you at least one spiritual gift. Sometimes he can give you more. And there's some men that he chooses, men, 
You know, there's a, there's a woman named Joyce Meyer now who was big in Christianity. And she says she's a pastor, okay? <laughs> and uh, I will say this, and, and the hook with Joyce Meyer is this, and I'll give her credit for this. You know, she was a woman who was abused and mistreated, had a life of abuse as a young girl, and thank God she got saved and she overcame that, okay? And her message is about overcoming the abuse, you know, from whether it's sexual, physical, emotional, whatever, okay? That's certainly fine. But that experience and that knowledge does not make you a pastor teacher. It makes you someone who can help people who are in that circumstance. But it doesn't make you a pastor teacher who can rightly divide the word of truth. She also flies around in her $50 million jet. She also lives in her $5 million mansion and drives her Rolls Royces and preaches the prosperity message. Okay? So, and yet, there's all, and if you look at the crowds where she goes, she sells tickets to, like, like, listen, freely you receive, freely give. If you've got to pay some pastor to get a message, what is, doesn't that tell you something right off the bat? The Bible says in the last days there's going to be false teachers among you who are going to make merchandise of you. What I would say, Joyce, get rid of the prosperity message, Scale down your lifestyle. Donate that money to people who need it. And go help women who are hurting. That's your ministry. Don't pretend to be a pastor teacher. That's the problem. And Christians don't have the discernment. Because you know what? They hear there's all these women in the crowds. Okay? And I feel for them. And they're there because they've been hurt and abused. And I get it. And, and she's got something to say to them. And thank God, but they got to pay her for it. Okay? And the problem is, she's also preaching a lot of other things that are absolutely false. Fake healing, prosperity message. Jesus went to hell and suffered for our sins in hell. No, he didn't. He, he suffered for our sins on the cross. You can, if you have enough faith in what you say, it'll happen. Positive confession. This is all occultism. Okay, and mind science. And there are many more things that are false. But Christians, you know why they don't have the discernment? Because the hook is she does say something that's necessary and important. And she helps some people. But listen, the Catholic Church, which preaches that you've got to get sacraments and be baptized and take a wafer from a priest and go to confession and do good works and penance, does a lot of good for a lot of people. They help poor people. They counsel people who are having marriage troubles and help fix marriages. They help young girls who've been abused. And because this goes on, Christians' discernment is what? Completely lost, because you know why? They don't understand one thing. Listen, Satan, Remember I taught you about human good can become evil? Because when we do human good to disguise something false, who's behind that? The Catholic Church feeds the poor, the hungry, helps the homeless, the drug addicts, the alcoholics, broken marriages, women who have been abused. Isn't that all good stuff? Sure it is. But then they teach you that to be saved, you need to go to a priest and confess your sins and do penance and get sacraments and do works, and you can never be sure that you're saved until you die, and then you probably have to spend some time in purgatory. And you should pray to Mary also to help you as an intercessor. Pray the Hail Mary to Mary to help get you there. Now, look what you got there. You go, oh, they're doing some good things. Yes, but Satan takes the human good to disguise the what? The evil. Joyce Meyer, doesn't she help hurting women? Absolutely. But she's also robbing your money from you and living a lifestyle like the rich and famous of Hollywood, Hollywood, 
Okay? So, where's the discernment, Christians? Now, if somebody was a baby Christian, a new Christian, I could give them a pass. But what about Christians who've been Christians for years? What have they been doing with their lives? What have they been doing with their lives? And the problem is, see those people that, are, that find their way to Joyce Meyer and the like? The majority of them don't want a prepared pastor. Okay? And all they want is somebody to speak to their emotional need at the moment. But you know what the problem with that is? You can only go so far. You can only go so far with that. So Joyce Meyer helps you overcome the abuse in your past. Okay, what about the rest of life? What about the rest of life? What about the rest of what... Doesn't God want to heal people that are broken and hurting? Absolutely, Jesus does. And he tells you, if you continue in my word, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you what? Free. The Bible says he sent forth his word, and he healed him. It tells us we have weapons of our warfare that are not carnal, but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. In every vain imagination and high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. You know what's going to heal our lives in the long run? The Word of God taught consistently by a prepared pastor. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And we need the discernment to understand this. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So Jesus gave gifted men to the church. All right, for what purpose? What's this pastor teacher's job? For the perfecting of the saints. What's that mean? For the spiritual what? Growth of the Christians. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Okay, three things that the pastor is given for. First thing, perfecting of the saints. What's that mean? for the spiritual growth of the believer. Perfecting means to come to, doesn't mean sinlessness, it means to be mature, complete. So, all right, so the pastor's given, his teaching is to bring about what? Spiritual maturity. If you sit under a prepared pastor and you are faithful, not, not oh, I, I, you know, I, I, oh, yeah, I, go, to, I go to church, but I, I kind of dabble. I'm kind of sporadic. No, God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay? Listen, a little bit is better than nothing, but it's not going to get you to where you need to be. You want your life to be better? You want to be healed? You want to be delivered? You want those strongholds to be pulled down, those things that you're struggling with? You need to take God's Word seriously. And, you know, I, I've preached this for years, and I've seen people plug in, and I've seen the transformation. Then I've seen other people who haven't plugged in, and they're still looking and waiting for a zapping to come from somewhere to just fix everything. And they've re what are they doing? They're rejecting God's plan. God's plan says the local church is the classroom, the Holy Spirit's inside you as your mentor to help you understand, the prepared pastor studies and teaches, and now you must what? Open up the Bible and study along with them. But they don't do that. Okay? They don't do that, and they wonder why the struggle is still going on. Okay, now look here. And then it says, for the work of what? The ministry. For the work of the ministry. You say, okay, what's the work of the ministry? Do you realize you have a gift? At least one from God? And that God wants you to have a ministry? You say, who, me? Yeah, you. He wants you to have a ministry. What do you mean? I'm not, I'm not a pastor. No, there's all kinds of gifts and there's all kinds of ministries. God has given you something as a gift that he wants you to use to help somebody else. But for you to be effective in discovering what that gift or gifts, because it could be more than one gift, in that ministry or ministries is, you have to grow. How are you going to grow? That's where the pastor teacher comes in. You see? And 
As you grow, you'll discover your gift or gifts, and you'll discover what? Where and when God wants to what? Use you and what he wants you to do. And then look at the last part. For the edifying of the body of what? Christ. What's the edify mean? It means to build what? Up. So as, as the pastor teaches, the saints grow. As they grow, they discover their gift, and they become what? Effective in using their gift. They have ministries, and as they conduct ministries, what happens? The body what? Grows. Not just numerically, but also spiritually. The body what? Grows. They minister to one another. Oh, this is God's plan. Look, that's God's plan. That's as simple as God's plan is. This is an amazing thing. Okay, I'm going to close with these couple things. The prepared pastor's job is this. He is to teach the milk of the word and the meat of the word. You say, what's the milk of the word? Well, let's touch on it tonight. He's, his job is to teach what is God's grace about? What does grace mean? What does grace do for us? What has God provided in grace? He's to teach position in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? What does that mean? What does it mean to be in Adam? What does it mean to be in Christ? He's to teach the finished work of the cross, which we've been doing on Sundays. How Christ's death and his blood has what? Provided a once and for all sacrifice that if you believe in Jesus, all your sins are forgiven and paid for. Eternal security and assurance of salvation. The teaching to help people know that they're saved and know that once they're saved, they can never lose it. Experiential sanctification, which is all about growth. He's to teach them what spiritual growth is about. He's to teach them about forgiveness, the character of God. What is God like? What is his attributes? Remember we did that whole study on his attributes? Omniscience, omnipresence, immutability, right? All that stuff. Sovereignty. The plan of God, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, how to trust God in testing. We call it faith rest. What's this doctrine of rewards? What, is, what does it mean that the Lord's going to reward us when we stand before him or we can lose rewards? He's to teach that. Chastisement, how God corrects us when we go wrong. What's prayer about? What is separation from sin and evil about? What is the second coming about? The resurrection, the eternal kingdom, the judgment of the lost. That's the milk of the word. And, even, and that's a lot. There's a lot there. Then there's the meat of the word. But that's for people who've grown up and matured, who've put the time in, taken up your cross, denying yourself, dying to self, sacrificing for Christ, suffering for Christ fighting spiritual warfare, persevering through tough times and trusting God faithfully, serving faithfully through thick and thin, spiritual discernment of good and evil. That's part of the what? Meat of the word. Bearing the burdens that God called you to bear that you might glorify him and much more. So the pastor's job is to teach the milk and the meat to perfect the saints. Okay. We noted that Satan, the kingdom of doctors, wants to distract believers from learning the word as the primary thing. Now, am I saying there's something wrong about great music? No. I love worship music. It's not the primary thing, though. If you said, uh, Pastor, you could have a church where this awesome soloists, a beautiful choir, fantastic worship for an hour and a half, but only a kind of wishy-washy 20, 30-minute sermon, or a church with no music, no worship, but a good, solid hour of Bible teaching, what would you pick? What do you think? You need to ask me that question? You know what I'd pick, and I hope you'd pick the same thing and pray that God will give you the what? Rest in his time, right? I love worship music. I love, you know, activities for the kids. Well, we do that, but that's not the primary thing. You know, social things so we can get to know each other. Absolutely, but not the primary thing. Not the primary thing. See? 
So he distracts him from doctrine through all those things, and he also does, number two, how, how else does, does Satan in the kingdom of darkness get believers away from the word? Apostate leadership in the pulpit. Men and women in the pulpit who are not prepared pastors. There's a lot of one-trick ponies out there, okay? There are some people in the pulpits who are just quacks, just stay away from them. There are people in the pulpits who are out and out charlatans and false teachers. Stay away from them. Then there are people in pulpits who say some, something that's not so bad, but it's all they got. They're one-trick ponies. Well, then you're not going to grow. You're not going to grow with a one-trick pony. It's got one message. It just keeps repeating it in different ways. And then you've got those that have something good to say in one particular area. Joyce Meyer can help some abused women, but ain't ever going to take anybody from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity. And in, by the way, in the meantime, you're going to help, all your giving and support is going to help her continue in that high lifestyle with the million dollar homes and jets and big bank accounts and cruises and all that goes along with it discernment folks that's what we need because in the angelic conflict Satan and the kingdom of darkness are trying to lead believers away from what the truth which is what Jesus said thy word is truth all right let's bow our heads for prayer father we're grateful and thankful tonight to have had this opportunity to study and to note these things from your word. Lord, as we continue to study this important subject, Lord, of Satan's offensive strategy and attack on your word and on the pulpit and on the preachers, I pray, Lord, that you would help us understand what it is that you require from us, Lord, what it is that you require from the church, what it is you require from each believer, what it is you require from the preachers and teachers, Lord, who lead your people. We dedicate the last moment tonight to anyone within the sound of my voice that's not saved. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Right now, in the privacy of your own heart and your own mind, between you and God alone, you can tell God, I know that I'm a sinner. But I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for my sins and rose again. And Lord Jesus, I'm trusting you and you alone as my Savior and my Lord. Let's take a moment of silent prayer. Now, Father, tonight, if your Holy Spirit has spoken to anyone's heart and they have believed in the Lord Jesus during the service, my prayer is that you give them assurance that you've forgiven them and saved them. I ask that you would reveal your love to them in a special way. And I pray, Father, that you lead them back to study your word, that they might grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, as we depart tonight, that you take the written word and make the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, more real to our hearts and minds. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Folks, it's been a pleasure. Now, remember, tomorrow night is prayer meeting. 
at 7. And if you can make it on out, our brother Richard Manguel's wake is Friday evening between 5 and 8 at uh, Mariani Funeral Home, and that's on 200 Hawkins Street in Providence with the funeral Saturday morning at 10 a.m. at the funeral home, followed by the burial at the Gate of Heaven Cemetery, 550 Wampanoag Trail, Riverside. Have a great night, folks. God bless.